As I was uh, watching the presidential address in, respond, in response to this tragedy, you know, I felt you know, Obama say something very profound when he said that, I know tonight I'm going to go home. Michelle and I are going to go home. And we're going to do something that every fa families in America are going to do. We're going to take our girls, our daughters, and hold them a little bit tighter and tell them we love them. And I think this is the lesson that loss teaches us. Loss has this unique and ironic way of, it seems to bring this pristine clarity and illumination about all the things that we take for granted on a daily basis. You see, Loss, in a sense, gives us the opportunity to realize that you might not have what you have and the people you have forever. And it brings this intrinsic value and helps you get this clarity about, oh my gosh, here is my kid, here's my friend, here's my parents, here's, here's the people I love. I don't even express it. You know, this week, we went to this Christmas concert at our son's school. And in the beginning, we, me, my wife and I had some miscommunication. She said, 8.30. It said 8.30. So I said, okay, I'll be there. Then she goes, no, it's 8.30 a.m. I'm like, uh, well, I have meetings, and this is what my wife told me on text. Dude, I love it when she says that. She goes, dude, this is non-negotiable. <laughs> so I know that when my wife says this is non-negotiable, it's non-negotiable. I said, okay, because I, you know, I, I just assumed that it would be a night. It doesn't make, I'm like, it doesn't make any sense. Who does it 8.30 in the morning? And here I am, here I am complaining about, you know, you know, I thought this is supposed to be one of the best schools. What, what is the deal with that, you know? And I'm thinking through this, and I'm talking about this, and non-negotiable, and I'm so glad I went. Because I noticed that, you know, little kids, when they're five and when they're four, when they go on stage with their friends, they, all they care about is not even the music, it's not even the songs, it's not any of that. I saw him look for me. And he could and it was so crowded, we were in the side of the hallway. And I saw him peeking in frantically, nervously, with you know, with his tooth missing, and <laughs> and grin just like you know, and, and and he was looking for me. Why? Why was he looking for me? Well, because all children want to be seen. And I wonder how many of those families that were lost. Some dad said, you know, next time, next weekend, I'll be there. Brothers and sisters that were mean to their little brothers and sisters or older. And then you, you, you find that they're not there. And here is how I would like to reconcile what this Advent season is all about. Advent is all about the gift of Jesus. The last couple of weeks we talked about the gift of hope, the gift of peace. And today I want to talk about the gift of joy. You see, joy is surprising because it's not what you expect. Joy is different from happiness because happiness is something you think you can get when you get something extra. A lot of people even think that joy is something that you get that's outside of you. But you see why Jesus came to the earth to save this place, to put it back together again, is not that you need something more, it's that he is what? Healing what is already broken. What caused that kid? In, in some newspapers, the New York Times, the Daily Post, a lot of online 
media is writing the shooter as a man. He wasn't a man. He was a boy. He was 20 years old. And I know that when, when someone does a heinous crime like that, you want to hold them accountable. But what, what was the reason? No one knows what the reason was. But the, let me just tell you, biblically speaking, the reason was his alienation. He was isolated. He took for granted. I mean, you go, okay, how does all this stuff happen? Why? And I told you, the answer is simple. It's a, it's a dark world. It's sinful. It's great darkness in the world. And that's why Jesus came. But here is the kicker of what I want to talk about today, of how joy relates to the season. How you can get joy in the midst of great loss. how you can get joy in the, in, in, the, in the midst of great loss. And I think Jesus could teach us that by the story of the gospel. So we're going to turn to Luke 15, and I want to quickly go over this, of how loss can bring joy. Now, you know the story about Luke 15. It's Jesus' story about, really, he's talking about people that have lost things. He starts with the sheep, then he talks about the coin, and then he talks about the lost son. And we, for a lot of us that heard the gospel story, it's about the father that, you know, gets in a quarrel with his youngest son. His son takes the inheritance, and he what? He leaves and says, you're dead to me. I just want your money, and he leaves. And what I want you to catch about Luke 15 is that this is the whole process of joy. That joy is actually surprising and ironic and not what you expect. So watch this. I want to read from verse 17, and it says very clearly here that the youngest son, after he went off and squandered all his wealth and all his money, and he came to New York City and did all that, because when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and sinned against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father's. But while he was still a long way off. Now read that part with me again. What does it say? But what? While he was still a long way off, this part never gets over me. I get a little emotional. His father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw, him, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. Now, catch this. The question of the story and the point is that the son, it's about reconciliation from alienation and isolation, isn't it? from apathy, when the son came to his senses, he came back. See, only when he lost everything, and hopefully we don't have to lose everything to learn something, but that's usually the case, but when the son lost something, he lost everything, he learned the true value of his father. All right, you see that? But without the loss, he would never have, what, as the text says, come to his senses. And just a father, without the son being rebellious, and without the son being a knucklehead, without the son being dumb and stubborn and young and youthful and sinful and wicked, uh, any other adjective you know of yourself? That applies to you. Without the son going off, causing what you call drama, a soap opera, whatever. The father would never feel the pain of loss either, even though it's not his fault. But there's a longing within him. This unexplainable longing, though he's not in error, he feels the loss of his son. Something he can't even control because he loves his son. And when you love someone, you can't 
keep them in captivity and lock them away. You've got to let them go. So you see this drama. And the loss brings out the intrinsic value. And you see the heartbeat of the father and the son, both alienated, but both longing for reconciliation. As you know, our family has a dog named Brownie. It's the cutest dog. People ask me what kind of dog it is. It's a Rottweiler. And then I say, Beagle, whisper that. I'm ashamed of that part. It looks like a puppy. And when we brought it home and adopted her, he, she was our first baby. It slept in our bed. I can't even imagine that, that happening anymore. But it slept in our room. Honey, we were crazy. I mean, we had a dog in the room. No. I can't imagine that. But as the dog grew up, it's, it's the most obedient. I mean, Christians should learn from this dog of how to obey their own, obey Jesus. This dog is the, most, the best behaved dog in planet Earth. It would, tell you, God is pleased with this dog. It's well, you know, Jesus says that to him right now. Well done, my faithful servant. I mean, this dog is the most obedient dog in the world, but it has one fatal flaw. It sheds like there is no tomorrow. One time, we were tired of washing this dog because the hair would just get all over the house. The hair is ridiculous. It is a curse. We took it to Petco. Petco said, never bring this dog back. Get this dog out of here. Why? We have 11 bags full of hair washing this dog. So, you know, so you, you live with the dog and you, you know, you love the dog, but every day it's just like, mm, why you shed so much? And the dog's just like, that's just how I was made. But this dog also runs away. This dog ran away about, I don't know, 14 times now, when the gate is open. And I remember Nathan, he goes, one day, he, you know, he was able to comprehend the loss of his dog, even though Nathan Brownie is petrified of Nathan. Because Nathan thinks that to be kind to the dog is grabbing its tail, grabbing its face, grabbing its nose, riding it like a horse, you know, and, 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 and this dog is petrified of Nathan. And when, you know, and he's actually kind of mean to her, always basically does what we do to him, to her. Because he feels like he has that power. He goes, bad dog, Brownie. You're going to get in trouble. You're going to have to go into your room just like I have to. You know, and he talks about this like this. But when he lost his dog for the first time, let me tell you, it's like it was the end of the world. He came to me and said, Daddy, Brownie ran away. We have to go look for her, right, Daddy? I'm just like, let her just go. Uh, Lord, God bless it. God bless the other owners in the future. But 17 times out of 10, the dog comes back. And you know, and, and you know what? Honestly, to tell you, and you know, there's a part of me that says that in the flesh. But the truth is, in my heart, I, I'm just like, oh. It, why is it when you lose something, the dog becomes cuter in your mind? And you're sent, you, you get sentimental about it. I'm just like choking up, you know, not tears, but just like in the heart, just like, that darn dog, why it has to run away? And then we're, we're fi trying to find this dog. And I mean, you have like the whole neighbor looking for this dog. 20 people, brownie, brownie, brownie. It's just a dog. And there's this weird sense of joy that comes when you find it. And the dog has no idea what's going on. The dog has no idea that everyone's searching for him or her. And you feel this. But without the loss, you cannot sense value. Why is that? We're hard-hearted. We're stubborn. It seems like loss is a gift, an opportunity to remember what you have. So how do you find joy in the midst of great loss? First, this passage teaches us this lesson. is that loss teaches us what? To what? Value 
Read it with me. What we've taken for granted in what? In real time. See, that's the problem. The problem is we're not grateful for what we have in real time. Real time is everything. It's when you say what you say. It's when you express what you express. But when you have it, we become, we fall into a sense of mediocrity and we don't say anything. I mean, this is the problem of romantic comedies and, or, or tragedies, right? You're supposed to say it in real time, you know? Two people, like you're on a date or a so-called date. And you know, the, the play or the role is at some point, someone has to say, hey, I love you. Of course, that doesn't happen much, but I did in my first date. But someone in real time has to carpe diem the moment and be like, I appreciate you. I, you, you mean this much to me. But that's hard for humanity to do when, you, when they're there because you think, and your confidence is in tomorrow, and you think that they're still going to be there tomorrow or that opportunity will be there. That's not true. Loss teaches you. What? Loss teaches you to look around you and appreciate what you have, cherish what you have, to value. And that value goes deeper. Okay? So let's go down here. And as we go down, I want you to ask yourself, what am I taking for granted that I have? And who am I taking for granted? And I know you feel it inside. Everybody look at someone and touch your heart and tell them, you're soft. You just don't know it yet. See, everyone is soft, but they just have a hard time processing. And actually, the problem is expressing it. Now, now here it is. Here is the punchline of the gospel, of how God begins to reconcile humanity with God. You see, we're lost. We're broken. That's why this tragedy happened and other tragedies happened. And that's why God is what? What is he doing about it? He's going after the lost. And here's a great picture of it. Verse 25, meanwhile, the older son was in the field. And now check this out. When he came near what? The house, he heard what? Music and dancing. So he called one of his servants and asked what was going on because this never happened before. You see, the, the drama in the story is that the son, the older son, knows what the house is like. He'd never seen his father be happy. He never seen his father quite like this, ridiculous and generous and crazy. And of course, that's his perspective. But he's sensing something from his father that he has not sensed before. And it is something that's extravagant. Something in him has taken place that he has not seen. And he says, your brother has, your brother has come, he replied. And your father has what? Killed a fattened calf. A lot of steak to go around. Because he has... He has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you, never disobeyed your orders, yet, can I see that part? What does it say? Can you read for me? You never gave me even what? A young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him? And look what, look what God says. Look what the father says. My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. And then he goes, but come in with me. Come in with me. For your, son, for your brother was dead. Now he's alive. He was lost, but now found. Celebrate with me. And here is the powerful story and the surprising element of joy. 
Joy is not what you think it is, is it? It's rediscovering the value of something you already have that you took for granted. And there's something that wells up inside that says it's familiar too. It's like, wow, I can't believe of this reconciliation, this moment. And you feel it inside. It's unexplainable. It's inexpressible, almost. And I felt like this. This week, after I almost blew not going to this concert. And I thought to myself, and I, I'm a, you know, in the train and in the bus. And I think of this sometimes. I think those kids that were murdered brutally were six years old. They were five. My son's five. It could have happened in the Upper East Side. Right? It's, per it's, it's per precarious. It, I mean, there was no reason, no purpose, nothing. It's just two people taking machine guns and shooting kids. It could have happened in any elementary school. And I thought about it. what would life be like without my son? And now playing Pokemon is a little, it's easier to do it. Playing basketball is a little, one more, Dad, one more, one more game. Because I think the luxury of tomorrow, you know, we could do it tomorrow. We could do it when I'm less busy or when I'm less busy. We could do it, you know, and you take it for granted, you take it for granted. And I, and I thought about what, what would it mean to lose your son? And then I realized that I can't think like that i got to think about who I have now. Amen? i got to think about who's in my life now, that he's here, that I could take this moment. So I decided what, what normal fathers do, well, I do, to express my love. Even though I tell them I love him, this is how my parents showed me they love me. They made me food. So I have this idea during the week of experimenting with breakfast. And Peeves was my guinea pig first. <laughs> and let me just tell you, God knows it's important when I go in the kitchen. And I'm not just grabbing something, I'm cooking. So I cooked breakfast. And I had this idea of cooking breakfast for my whole family. So I practiced on Peeves. So come in. He came in. Oh, you made, you, you cooked? I'm like, yeah, man. Bacon, turkey bacon. Sunny side up eggs. He goes, you know how to do that? Yes. I experimented. Cheddar cheese with the, with the turkey bacon all over together with toasted bread. It's delicious. When that cheddar and that yolk comes together, integrates, pollinates, it's a beautiful dance, symphony in your mouth. And, and, you know, and Peeves tried it and he was like, he wasn't lying either, I promise you. One day I'll make all of you breakfast. He's like, no, please. But I, I practiced it, and I remember Saturday morning, I wanted to make breakfast. And then one by one, the family members started coming in, and I said, I'm going to make breakfast. And my wife said, you are? <laughs> she was like surprised by joy. And I said, yeah, I'm going to make breakfast. I, I brought all the stuff. I brought two carton of eggs out, cheddar out, the turkey bacon out. Started cooking eggs, sunny side up, some scrambled. I felt like... I was working at a restaurant. I think I'd be pretty good at it. And so I was cooking all this. And one by one, people started eating the sandwich. And they started saying, wow, this is so good. And I'm like, that's right. I got skills. <laughs> my, son, my son then came down and said, I want some of that. That's so good. He started eating it. And then my wife started eating it. And this is conflicting because you, we, we think that joy us getting joy is about me getting something for me. We think that joy is if I just could get a peace of mind. It, we think joy is about me getting this other thing or fill in the blank and then I'll be happy. But you see, here is the punchline of the gospel and here's the punchline of what I learned this week. Joy, at that moment, I felt something like bubbling up inside. People are like, oh, this is good. They're eating and I'm cooking. You see the fry pan going, 
you, you hear it sizzling. I felt something that I haven't felt for a long time. It was joy. I was surprised by joy. Why? Because I was expressing and valuing the people I love. Giving. So how do you find joy in the, great, in the midst of great loss? Well, lastly, sometimes what? Loss is what? The? That's right. You can't take the class of joy in life until sometimes you lose. And that's why life is a gift that God gives us. And that's why these experiences should not be wasted. Why families are going to hold their kids tighter is because what they realize is that they can lose. Why we need to express how we feel is because of the people that might no longer be there. Why we need to tell that person we love them is because you might lose them. And why God sent his son. As, as the famous passage in John 3, 16, is that what he said? Because God so loved the world that he gave his only one son that what? We might know what? Not perish. And the gospel story is that even in this passage in Luke 15, even if one person turns to God, there's great joy in heaven. Why? Because they're surprised by joy. It's reconciliation. Today, I want to ask you these losses that you have this year in your own life. Could you use them to learn about the value that you have all around and God's given you? Yeah. I pray today that we would look inward and be surprised by joy. I want, I want you to feel at this Advent season as we celebrate Christmas. Next weekend, I want you to feel this joy bubbling up inside of you because you are so grateful. And as we close today in prayer, I want you to stand with me. And I want you to receive this from the Lord. So what is the secret key to joy? It's not something extra. It's something I already have. Joy is equivalent to gratefulness. Gratefulness is equivalent to contentment. It's to be happy with what I have. It's to be grateful for what has been given. People, God the Father has given us Jesus. That is the best gift. I pray we would rediscover and be surprised by joy. So will you lift your hands with me to the Lord? And we're going to give thanks today. In spite of the losses of our lives this year, in spite of all the turbulence going on, we're going to be, we're going to say, God, thank you for being the author of life. Thank you for giving me this gift. And though I'm stubborn and, and though Sometimes I'm lost and confused. I'm going to start seizing, start expressing the joy that you've already given me. I pray, Father, today that we would rediscover joy. We would rediscover value in people. We would rediscover the value in the gospel. We would discover the hope that's been given to us by the Messiah that came to save the world. We lack nothing. Because
afternoon we thank you for the gift of Advent the gift of joy in Jesus because Jesus you haven't come to give us something more you've come to help us rediscover what's already been given as you restore our relationship with God once we were alienated and far from God now through your provision of grace we are close to God and father we taken granted the people in our lives but your love has come and help us heal and forgive and restore and appreciate and value the people you've given us father i pray the best way to celebrate christmas this season as we observe advent together as a church i pray that no external gift will replace the ecstasy of being surprised by joy. I want to release today in Jesus' name, all throughout Christmas, as you rediscover contentment, rediscover gratefulness, we would all, in Jesus' name, be surprised by joy. In your name we pray, amen. Let's give God a clap offering. God bless you. We'll see you next week. Bring some people.